Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Teach for Justice podcast. This is season one, episode two. This is our interview with Victoria Thompson. Our guest today is also known on social media as Victoria the Tech. A little bit about our guest today. Victoria Thompson is an education industry executive at Microsoft, an instructional designer for EduSpark and an ST ambassador. She has been in education for seven years and began her journey teaching fifth and sixth grade math and science in Somerville, South Carolina. After completing her master's degree in curriculum and instruction, she moved to the Seattle, Washington area in 2018, where her career has pivoted to focusing on digital transformation, STEM integration in schools, technology in instruction, and using technology to bridge equity gaps in education. She has presented at ISTE, FETC, TCEA, Impact Education, Q, and DigSit Summit on topics such as creating inclusive math classrooms, culturally responsive STEM education, and equity in educational technology. Additionally, she was recently awarded the title of one of the top 30 K-12 IT influencers in 2021 by EdTech Magazine. I think you're going to like it. Stay tuned for our interview with Victoria Thompson. All right, Victoria, uh, I want to start out by acknowledging uh, that one simple concept that you put out into the Twitter to the Twitterverse a while ago um, mm-hmm. really hooked me into following you on social media originally. And it was the idea that teachers can be uh, like targets of this concept um, of the exploitation of empathy. empathy. Could you briefly expand on that? Yes. And this could honestly be its own like hour long (laughs) session to be completely honest. Um, But I'll give just a little bit of like background context as to how I arrived at that space. So my wife, Courtney is former air force, current like nursing profession. um, And she like moving from a very male dominated field, which is the military, um, into a very female dominated field, which is nursing, Mm -hmm. was just noticing a lot of things here and there that she felt would not fly if she were in the military full time. Right. She is in the reserve, so she still gets that flavor. Um, But for the most part, you know, she's very like, full steam ahead with her new career and um you know it was during covid it was 2020 i mean we're still in covid right you know we're all working from home and like she was listening into some of my conversations at work and because she's nosy and i was also listening in to some of her conversations and i remember one night when we were just kind of like chatting having dinner like having dessert whatever you know she's like i just don't know how this is supposed to work And I said, what do you mean? And she said that she was in a meeting where um, there there were a lot of different job opportunities and volunteer options that were posted and given. But essentially what happened was her superiors were encouraging everybody in the room to take the unpaid volunteer work because it's supposed to feel good, you know, Mm -hmm. and you get the experience (laughs) and you get to do all these things. And, you know, it's just good to have on a resume. So, you know, she turned to me and she's like, I've never dealt with this in the military. You know, like if I were asked to volunteer, it would be like my squadron reaching out to me and saying, hey, we need three volunteers for one hour in order to do something like it's never an expectation. It's always an ask. Right. So then she's like, you know, you're like you, you were in the classroom. Like at that point, I was like in the classroom virtually. I was about to transition into being an instructional coach. And she's like, what exactly did you deal with? And, you know, I'm, I'm a big Disney Parks fan and a Disney movie fan. Mm-hmm. So it's like that scene in Ratatouille where like <laughs> the food critic eats the food and like he flashes back to his childhood. But for me, it was like I flashed back to when I was in South Carolina where I was asked to do so much unpaid. And when I said no, I got reprimanded. It was when I was a club advisor for $100 a year, where if I actually parcel it out and I did, it was more like $1 a month. You know, it's stuff like that where I'm thinking professionally, we have to make sure that we protect ourselves, we protect our intellectual property, and we protect our empathy. 
So that's where I can kind of like, and it's not trademarked or anything, but for me, like exploitation of empathy comes from workplaces, schools, organizations, because it's not just education, but it's no. primarily in female dominated professions. They exploit the fact that we naturally want to help people. We're carers. We want to help. We're helpers. We love people. We just want to be there to make an impact and be that person. So that way, if somebody were to come back and say, okay, like Victoria helped me, like that's prideful. But also at the same time, we got to be careful about that because people will take that and they will run with it. And that's why you see teachers getting in at 6 a.m. and staying until 6 p.m. Part of, uh, you, you know, when I was a student teacher um, and my cooperating teacher was terrible she could also be another like mm -hmm. podcast topic <laughs> well, but... mine was a doozy that's mm -hmm. for another time but yeah. yes one of the things that I was personally evaluated on was when I come in and when I leave like that was something that oh, they wow. took stock of so I remember my cooperating teacher saying Victoria's great she gets in earlier than me now and she leaves later than me now. This teacher was already getting in at six o'clock in the morning and leaving at six o'clock at night. That's 10 hours of work yep. when you're contractually obligated for anywhere between seven to eight. So mathematically, because that's my background, right? Like they're already receiving at least eight, like, sorry, four hours of extra labor a day. That's an additional anywhere between like 16 to 20 hours a week. And we have nothing to show for it. We're not getting paid extra. We don't get overtime. So when I think really just about exploitation of empathy, it's protecting yourselves and making sure that you're putting yourself first. Because so often in education, we're asked to do the opposite. But I know yeah. like if I need to take care of my family, if I need to have a dentist appointment, if I need to take a mental health day, then that is me taking care of me. And that's what I have to put forward. I, I'm mentoring. People just have to deal right with it. <laughs> right. No, I'm mentoring a teacher right now, and, and yeah. she's already done, signed up for too many things, and it's becoming a recurring theme in our in our mentoring sessions. It's like, hey, you know, you you get these things are clashing. You mm -hmm. have to prioritize, and three of the four things that you have due today have, right. nothing, have nothing to do with uh, teaching in the classroom, and you're not mm -hmm. tenured yet, right? And so. Uh, uh, taking on more stuff is not going to improve your uh, review. You're being evaluated yes. on what you do in the classroom and it's, mm -hmm. it's tricky. And I I've been in a couple of different schools and I've had some admin who are better at exploiting than others. And, and uh, some who will say, are you sure you seem to have a lot on your plate? And so, uh, but those are, those are rare. I, yeah. I definitely think that those are rare, but right. And I'm even gonna... as a consultant, as you know, like yeah. I, I, I've had to step away from engagements because it's it just gets too too wild. Uh, like I was a facilitator not too long ago, um, only for about three months before I said, like this is just too much for my plate right now. And I'm more than happy to come back next year or maybe the year after or whenever you need me. But between transitioning into this new role right? Um, like figuring out what the rest of my contracts look like, getting my life together, just period. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I need to figure out what my relationship with y'all looks like. And thankfully it was a very positive conversation because I think we're all in the same space where nobody wants anybody to be overextended. If you have people that are on your workforce, on your team, on your whatever, and if they can't deliver, then the conversation should not be something's wrong with you. The conversation instead is what's going on and what can we take off your plate backslash? What can we do to make sure that if we want to continue this collaboration, that you actually have the time to free up. And that's something that I think has really been highlighted for me during COVID. Uh, thankfully, this has been the only time where I've had to be like, ooh, I, like, I, I am stepping away. Right. Um, but, uh, but, but before, I feel like the conversation would have been, you're not you know, putting out what's happening. Whereas now the conversation is what's on your mind, what's on your heart, how can we you know, like alleviate some burden? Or you know, we'd love to have you but right now might not be the right time because there's so much going on in the world. And I really appreciate that narrative shift because sometimes it's not the work. It's, it's just what's going on around us, you know? 
Yeah, my admin has impressed me uh, over and over. They've had plenty of opportunities to be exposed for not being uh, who they say they are. They've just come through so many times. And, and that's good. And, yeah. And so, you know, people with a, a decent um, background, you know, can move around, especially with so many teachers leaving. But, but you know, I'm one of those people that recognizes they're in, they're in a really good spot. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, all right, let's, um, let's get to, to equity here. Um, all right. I know you've done some work <laughs> in that. And, and I recently listened to uh, uh, something you did for uh, Everfy with uh, equity and SEO, but mm-hmm. you know, this acronym DEI seems to be making the rounds, right? And for listeners who are unfamiliar, DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. What are, what are a couple of obstacles that you've encountered implementing DEI programs? You know, is it, is the problem buy-in or is it execution in your experience? It's everything, honestly, it's both. (laughs) So if I were to be completely candid, I would say it was really 50-50. So the buy-in is a piece that is mostly invested in not just educators, but also for educational leadership. Mm-hmm. And whenever I write for Edutopia, like that is my main topic because there's a lot of focus on educators and teachers. But honestly, a lot of this rests on educational leadership as well. Right. Educators will notice when something is important to a principal, an AP, a super, or whoever we're talking about. And they will also notice when it is not important. So if you're walking around saying diversity, am I right? You know, to a certain (laughs) degree, but then there's no backup, right? You're not infusing. Oh, we notice. (laughs) Right. You're not talking about it in your meetings. Then teachers will know that this is just a buzzword. And I, I, again, I'm not in like a leadership role anymore. So I can say this candidly. I don't think that sometimes educational leaders recognize or understand the impact that it has on a school. Because for educators, it does seem trivial when they are being asked to attend like DEI meetings, equity trainings, um, you know, like diversity meetings, and the principals aren't there. Right. The teachers aren't there. Or something that I find to be the most egregious is when we're supposed to be having this equity meeting and people are sending emails the whole time right? Or people are trying to chat me the whole time. It proves to me that you're not invested in this because you are not paying attention. And we take note of that. I don't know that all administrators appreciate that we're, you know, I don't think so. Especially if we don't want to be there. We're, what time did you show up? Are you guys chatting in the back? Are you sneaking Mm -hmm. out? Because we're, we're, we're watching all of that stuff, especially if we didn't as a group of teachers say, Hey, you know what? We'd really like to see some some equity and diversity inclusion stuff. If we didn't call for it, and in our district, without getting too much into it, there was a an incident uh, of you know hate speech, and mm-hmm. you know, for a year, every school had to do uh, some training, and, and we know what the source of it was, but um, you know it, it was a result of you know what an incident at one school, um, and. You know, some of us are like, well, you know what, it, we, we have to go anyway. It is what it is, but let's make the best of it. Maybe there are some nuggets here. And and there was everyone was focused, though, on why we had to be there. And it was it was a little messy. Mm-hmm. And I've also been in those situations as well, where like we have equity train or had in my previous role mm-hmm. where it, it wasn't required like per se, uh, like I know y'all are listening, you can't see me right now, but I am doing air quotes. <laughs> um, but there was a, like a monetary stipend, if that yep. makes sense. So then it becomes a question of, are you doing the equity training because you want to learn? Or are you doing the equity training because it's an extra however many dollars right, an hour is. for curriculum rate? And then that, again, like muddles the situation because we want to make sure we have people that are in it again, for that buy-in purpose. And then I think that other point too, that you were talking about, like, it's not just the obstacle of the buy-in, but it's the problem and the obstacle of the execution, because we all want equity, hopefully, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our schools and our sites. But then I hear rhetoric like, 
Well, we well, like my school has all white kids, so we thankfully we don't have to deal with this. Mm-hmm. Or they do things like what I refer to as easy diversity, where they're like, well, our school has 20% students of color, but right, it's built in. <laughs> right. But the like the breakdown of the students of color, like it's like you got two black kids, 50 Asian kids, right? Like 10 indigenous kids. So it doesn't really give a full breakdown of like who is actually in the school system. Um, because again, that's easy diversity to me. You're not actually giving a full picture of who is in your school. And when I think about execution as well, um, when, when I was at IdeaCon, um, because I was just there two weeks ago from the time of this recording, mm-hmm. um, I, I got a very good question on a panel just regarding, okay, so my school says that they don't have to deal with this because of our demographics. Majority white teachers, majority white kids, they don't have to deal with it. My response back, because it was a good question, I, I get asked it all the time, right? So at, at, the, at my last school site, what we did was we kind of created a profile of the ideal student. Like if they were to graduate K through 12, K through six, whatever we might have, like what exactly do we want them to do and how do we want them to be? So if you all say you want them to be a critical thinker, that means that they can't just be reading the same five books. You know, if, like if you say you want them to be a global collaborator, that means that you can't have them just interacting with people within your town. Small town doesn't mean small mind. So if you want to walk the talk and actually figure out what it looks like for a kid to leave this school, class, district, whatever, then this is the profile and this is how we can move it forward. And I found that to be really successful just for starting these conversations because a lot of people, again, they're just, diversity that sounds good and and they don't know how to move it forward um but that mission and that vision i think is so crucial because you like you can't go anywhere if you don't know where you really want to end up well and ending up is an interesting phrase because you know i'm i'm going to spend a year trying to understand what it means to teach for justice i don't think i'm going to necessarily find the answer you know i just know that trying to do every day with that lens or with that goal in mind will, will, is going to be a little bit more rewarding and take advantage of some opportunities I would have missed if I were just teaching for, I don't know, mastery mm-hmm. of, a, of, a, of, a, of a curriculum that we're all sort of feeling like is a little harmful, you know? Um, and so I don't know that we're going to get to, okay, equity check, diversity check. No, because it's an infinity sign instead of a line, yeah. you know, we, we, because schools are so dynamic in their spaces and education is always changing. It has to be a time where the loop just keeps going. And if it doesn't go, then it's like, what are we even doing? Right. And, but, uh, you know, admin and people throwing money at it, they want some kind of quantifiable progress. You know, or somebody tasked with it has to demonstrate their progress. Mm-hmm. And how do you quantify we've moved forward in equity? You know, um, I don't I don't know necessarily what that looks like, but um, I do know from the teacher front that there are certain kinds. I, I feel my claim is that there are certain types of teachers that sort of, that get in the way. Have you found that there are certain groups or certain mindsets of teachers that seem to be getting in the way of some of this equity work? Yes. Um, So I will preface this by saying, because I always have to preface it. um, If you are a white woman listening, I'm not coming for you. Like This is not the intent of this statement. What I am saying, though, is that if we take a look and again, just kind of thinking of nursing with my wife and then looking Mm -hmm. at education with myself, both professions, 80% are dominated by what is identified as middle-class white women. That is 80%. Um, There are studies on this, y'all can look them up, but even surrounding us, like we can kind of look around our schools and be like, okay, right? Like who's around us? And and it is a lot of white women. That's the stat. I mean, that's the statistic. Right, right. That is is literally the facts, right? right? That's that's same in Southern California, absolutely. Yes, so one of my favorite resources that I like to pull up um, and I don't know if I can drop it in the chat and then maybe you can put it in the show notes. Is that okay? okay. Yeah, I'll try it. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, that would be awesome. Let me go ahead and bring it up. Um, uh, misbehavior or misconception. 
Sorry, misbehavior and misinterpretation. My apologies. It is a little bit later here. It's like end of the work day. Um, <laughs> but this is one of my favorite, favorite resources for folks to just kind of go ahead and get started. Because even me, like when I was starting out teaching and even now in my role, I think is this misbehavior or is this misinterpretation? Mm -hmm. And this resource is all about closing what is known as the discipline gap through cultural synchronization. So if I were to kind of break that down like layman's terms, or as I like to explain as a Disney fan, explain like I'm goofy, okay. right? So like, if, so like if a kid doesn't bring a pencil to class, we're mad because now we're taking time to figure out why the kid didn't bring the pencil. Now we're trying to figure out exactly what's going on in this space. Now we're taking learning time away, yeah. right? So while I'm working with this one kid, now 25 are acting up behind me. But the question should not be, why didn't you bring the pencil? The question should be, how can I help you get to where you need to be? Right. Now, I have worked with teachers a lot in the past where if I were to say that, they would flip out. I don't give out pencils. What do you mean? Like they didn't bring a pencil. <laughs> Everybody should come prepared. In the like, real even world, the last, you have to bring a pencil. Right. And even that, the last school I that I worked that. at, right. even the last school I worked at where parents were paying anywhere between thirty to $60,000 a year to send their kids. Right. That, that's a that's a salary. I would have kids that would not show up with pencils. Yeah. So the question again, like that, that's the misinterpretation. Right. Like you are spending this much like this amount of money and you can't bring a pencil. That's the misinterpretation. The question becomes the misbehavior. Right. So what is actually happening here? Maybe there's something going on at home. Like I had a moment, I remember when I was teaching at that school where uh, a kid woke up and, and their parents were gone. This is oh, wow. again, 30 to $60,000 a right. year to send their kids and, and their parents just decided to take off. Nanny didn't come yet. Kid was home. Kid was terrified. Came to school crying. I, like, was I going to punish that kid? No. Right. The conversation becomes what's going on and how can I help you? And when I think also about this resource and how it breaks that down, it's about breaking from the, again, white middle class norms that are kind of assumed in school, right? Like those hidden rules of school that we have to really look into who our students are and think, okay, where do I go from here? And I think another good example of this is slant. Right, like eyes on the teacher, tracking, right. like th those kinds of things. <laughs> Several cultures, direct eye contact is seen as being disrespectful, or even a lot of rhetoric that goes on, like surrounding, like, well, I don't use like Mrs. So and so or like Mr. So and so in my class. And again, like that's their prerogative. But like for me as a Black woman, I do go by misses because I, I have had times where I've been called little girl, right? Like girl, mm. woman, like I, I, I am not called by my honorific or even with my master's degree, they don't acknowledge it. Mm. So for me, like it's a sign of respect for me if you do call me Mrs. Thompson, mm -hmm. whereas for other people, it might be a little bit more fluid. So I just always say, try to figure out the person behind the norm. Right. Like all of these standards have kind of been set again by those like white middle class. This is what we expect our kids to do. Who are they behind that if they don't come from that? And what is the difference between the misbehavior and the misinterpretation? Yeah, the pencil thing is a great example. And, and what I I'm in a district that is socioeconomically very diverse. And so um, sometimes when we're, if we're in a district PD, we're not we're not having the same conversation. Uh, for on pencils, a lot of teachers at my particular school, which is a little bit on the on the uh, you know more uh, on the on the less affluent side, I, I have a box of a hundred pencils next to a pencil sharpener. Right, you need a pencil, grab it. If you need it for the day, fine. Return it if you can. Whatever. It's not. It wasn't super hard for me to get a bunch of pencils, throw them in a box next to a pencil sharpener, and and just kind of take that whole that whole scenario of, well, where's your pencil? Why didn't you bring one? At, in, in the workplace, you have to bring your tools and have that whole weird conversation holding up the whole class. Mm -hmm. so you have a pencil, man. If you can return it, return it when you get a chance. But, right. Uh, I've been in meetings in prior jobs where like someone told, 
like just don't even show up with paper, <laughs> right? right. Like, oh, don't don't laptops. I'm like, okay, so if y'all aren't coming prepared, then how do you expect for the like those same expectations to be put onto kids? Teaching the same teachers. way where you are 55, not you meaning you, Mr. Right, Silva. Right. You know. The teachers are the worst. Right. It's like if you are 55 and you're coming without a laptop or paper or a pencil, and then you're gonna and, and you have full agency as an adult. Right. Like I wake up every day. I get dressed. I get my materials ready. I know what I need to do to be successful. Sometimes when you're a kid, you don't know. Yeah. Or it changes. You have six teachers in a day. And for this teacher, it's this and this teacher, it's that. And 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 uh, it's but but in some school systems trying to, you know, you get a group of teachers trying to talk about equity, equity and grading or equity and, you know, just prep. What is prep or uh, equity and preparation look like yeah so everyone starts throwing around well you do you and we'll do us and it's like well is that what's best for kids or can we can we agree maybe on two or three things Mm -hmm. you know I mean um, my next uh, interview is going to be with one of my uh, colleagues here we're going to be talking about things like dress code and and also EL students and 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 uh, some of the, the stuff behind that we had some dress code meetings over here that really took a weird turn yeah. in terms of what's dress behind code. yeah <laughs> and you know it's kind of like I, what what which character from the movie footloose are you trying to channel right now i'm not sure but uh we need to get back to just you know taking gender out of the vocabulary in the just let's start with that you know um but but it's it's uh it's hard to get people on the same page if there isn't an equity champion right. on, on staff. And, and luckily we have two or three um, dress code champions on staff right now. And she's That's responding good. to her own kids. Um, but it hasn't been without tension just on that one, you know, on that one little issue. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and I think too, like, so the question was like, what's the problem? The yeah. antidote is exactly what you talked about, where it's those equity advocates, where they they are the opposite of the teachers that will refuse pencils. They will, and, and not that we should be giving pencils freely, right? But they're the ones that will be taking the kids to the side and being like, so I noticed you haven't brought your pencil in three days. Or like, hey, I noticed you, like you came to school without your backpack. That was a big thing for me. When I taught in South Carolina, there were kids coming without their backpacks. Right. Well, it's, well, it's because what like, did you think left- was going to happen here today? <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, and like that's so my thing is, and people know this when they work with me, whether they're a kid or whether they're an adult, my catchphrase, whenever they know something like, like there's about to be trouble is, so what's the game plan here? Right. right, <laughs> right? So right. like, so what's the game plan? Like you didn't yeah. come to school with your backpack. You don't have any of your supplies, but like those types of conversations like lead to, you know, well, I have split custody and I was at my mom's house, but then my dad didn't bring the backpack because it accidentally left it at his. Or like, I remember when I was in South Carolina one time um, and I was actually student teaching, um, there was a student where roaches crawled out of their backpack because there were just so many issues. Like, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Just kind of like, cleanliness wise at home where the student was terrified to bring their backpack again so (sighs) it's stuff like that where when we again have conversations again it's the misinterpretation versus the behavior well i'm never gonna knock a kid (laughs) for like not bringing a backpack does it suck that they're not prepared for the day yes but our job as the adult is not to say what's wrong with you our job is to say how can i help you today or draw everyone's attention to that right yeah because i had had it happen before where it's like everybody look at this backpack and i'm I'm like oh my god there are roaches crawling out of the backpack and you are the adult and you're drawing attention to that like no because it just feels this wave of shame and 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 that's the last thing that will stick with them for a while yes yes a while Mm-hmm. Um, tardy became another thing. We don't have a consistent tardy enforcement thing, you know, at our school. And I remember one year created a Google form and it was like, okay, after three, it's like, okay, you got to fill out the Google form, but it asked, they could answer it privately. And it asked who brings you to school? Do you know how many tardies you have? What, what can I do to help you? I got so much good information mm-hmm. from that Google form that I, that I then sat with the kids about it and said, Hey, 
that's a crazy situation. You don't drive yourself and I get it. Um, uh, but just c- keep communicating with me. They were so grateful that someone bothered to yes. ask them what's That's up. The point. Yeah. We're, you know? I mean, like, e- even though educators are, of course, like uplifted as heroes and people that are for <laughs> kids, what I find more often than not is that even if a kid has like a team of 10, teachers they might have one or two that they are like this person is looking out for me or like this person really cares for me and it's not that every kid has to be saved because not every kid needs to be saved and not every kid wants that but they at least need somebody that they can go to as like an external adult I I very strongly believe in that um but what I'm finding more often than not is that sometimes it's just really challenging for kids to connect with adults and sometimes adults are just straight up like, no, I don't want to talk to you about this. No, yeah. I don't want you to be talking to me about this. And, you know, when I taught sixth grade, so my first year of teaching was actually sixth grade science. So even though like math is my jam, I actually at, began in science. And uh, there were a couple of kids that came out to me and, you know, like I'm a, I'm a gay woman. I'm like, this is awesome. And, you know, like respecting those boundaries and also respecting who I am. Um, you know, I'm like, hey, like, l- like, let me know if you just want to kind of talk through things. If you need a supportive ear, I am more than happy to help you. Um, but there was another teacher on the team that straight up shot them down and was like, why are you coming to me to talk about this? I don't want to hear about this. This is none of my business. Go to your next class. And then they came to me during lunch crying because yeah, they were the just message that so that disappointed. You know, it's it's challenging when you're a kid and you think that you can confide in somebody and then that person does not become confidable. So yep. it's like, who do you turn to? I'm rambling at this point, but that's OK. Yeah. But uh, but but this is, you know, where we need to put the, the 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 empathy, the love and the compassion, you know, is, you know, it's on ourselves. But, you know, these kids, some people shy away from from that. And, and mm-hmm. you know, um, this is, you know, leading me up to, to one of my questions here is, well, how do you respond to teachers who, if you try to talk about this stuff in a department meeting, you know, say, oh, DEI is, it's just a trend. And like so many other trends, we're going to move on from this. How do you respond to them without wanting to just punch them in the face? <laughs> well, Hmm, let me think about this because <laughs> I've heard this. I mean, I've heard this. Oh, D- SEL, like, right. you know, I'm, you know, Pear Deck has all those templates and it's so easy to slide one in um, mm-hmm. and check them in and say, hey, you know, how you doing today and all that stuff. It's so easy to do now. And if other teachers are doing it, some students will recognize the one or two teachers that are rejecting, you know, the, the SEL stuff, the teachers who say in a meeting in front of adults, the best thing I can do for these kids is get right back to teaching content, mm-hmm. provide them with a sense of normalcy. Yeah. And, and I'm sitting there thinking that that's in your mind, really the best thing you can do for right. them right now. Mm-hmm. I don't know. There's, there's a little disconnect there between that situation we're in right now. Right. So my apologies for the growling. No, that's okay. My dog, Ren, is like looking outside. There are kids coming back from school. He's like, who are these children? Because he hasn't <laughs> seen a school bus in a while. Um, but so for me, I start with three core tenants. Okay. Tenant number one is that we need to acknowledge that normal did not work for a lot of people. And we have to be upfront and honest about that. If normal worked for everybody in your school, your classroom, whatever, then you would have no problems. You would have no parents contacting you or no families mm-hmm. contacting you. You wouldn't need to have IEP 504 meetings, right? You would not need to have uh, PTA meetings. You would not need to be having these kind of whole staff PDs where we're addressing these issues. And my first school that I worked at when I was in South Carolina, I remember we would always have to unfortunately um, have conversations about like what they refer to as gaga, which is essentially like making sure that like you're not in spaces alone with students, right? Like making sure that like all the windows are open, making sure you're not touching students inappropriately. And and like for a multitude of people that is common knowledge. But my admin at the time said, and this has always resonated with me, we wouldn't need to keep bringing it up if it didn't have to happen. 
Right. And an admin kind of, behind the scenes knows. Exactly. You know? Right. So that's kind of how I view diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are, we're not bringing it up if, if it didn't have to continuously happen. That's why we see weird stuff like a slavery project in third grade where kids are having to pretend that they're slave owners. That's why we see crazy things like the Sokatoa lady, you know, and that was an indigenous student that filmed that video. And that was right near me. That was yeah, right near yeah, me. Yeah. And there were people coming to her defense. Oh, it's just cute. And that but went no, on. It ain't, it ain't cute. Nothing <laughs> no, about this is cute. You saw the whole, that went on for a couple of minutes. Mm-hmm. I mean, she got mm-hmm. a little loose on that one. And that oh, was. She, yeah, she was. Ooh. She was interesting. <laughs> um, but, but, but again, this doesn't come up unless we need to keep having conversations about it. So that's number one. And I also, especially if you're district leadership or just school leadership listening in, like the push for all of these different types of alternative schoolings, like hybrid learning, like remote learning, like remote schools, that is a sign that normal, like everybody face-to-face in the building just did not work for a lot of people. Um, at, like at my last school, we did lose quite a few students to online academy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and a couple other schools I've worked at, a lot of them have switched into either AB models or, you know, they've switched into something else because that's the solution that works for them. So to be innovative, you have to be proactive instead of reactive. The second kind of goes back to what I talked about before, which was about the profile of the student. Because even in the school districts where everybody looks exactly the same, You can't tell me that there's a super or a principal or a teacher or whoever that doesn't want their kid to be like a global collaborator, global thinker, um, like critical thinker, collaborator. The adjectives can go on and on. Um, But 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 essentially that doesn't happen just by staying within this bubble. Yeah. And those adjectives are on some poster in their classroom somewhere. Right. Yeah. It's like collaborator, (laughs) thinker. (laughs) There was something on TikTok um, and and, and I'm not on TikTok, but my wife is where like military TikTok is like a thing. So it was this woman and she was like, like describing adjectives about her husband who was a Marine. And she's like, he's loyal. He's collaborative. He's wonderful. He's a Marine. So sometimes like as an inside joke at the house, um, like when Courtney's like, throw me an adjective, I'm like loyal. (laughs) But, But that's how I feel about a lot of these posters, you know, that go up in schools. And like, I remember at my last school, it was PAC and it was like perseverance. So people uh, on, uh, (laughs) <laughs> we're waving our arms even my though motion detector lights with him. Yeah. <laughs> right we are making the lights come on <laughs> that's awesome yep. um but yeah like at my last school it was like perseverance collaboration kindness and i forget what the a stood for <laughs> but it's like what you hit kindness and you're like oh Right. mm -hmm. And it's like, what even do these words mean? So as a school, y'all have to figure out what that means. What does it mean for your student to have perseverance? That means maybe working with people that they have completely different viewpoints from or people that they've never met before. What does it mean to be kind? And I hate that phrase, be kind. Um, I have mixed feelings about it. Yeah. It, It has good intentions, but I feel like sometimes it is weaponized to be like, you just called me the N-word, be kind. And I'm like, no, right. I'm not going to be kind yeah. to you My if reaction you are being is rude to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's and, yeah. and what some people consider unkind is simply uh, a, a very directly stated observation about your behavior. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm, I'm just calmly but directly mirroring right. your behavior. So I'm not being unkind. I'm calling you out, though. Wow, right. right? And that's a core tenet of of all this, which is actually going to be my third one, where it's like, when we see something, we have to say something. We have to call it out. And it doesn't mean that, like, we hate each other, you know, like some or, or like it doesn't mean I'm anti this, that and the other. What it means is this is an opportunity for growth and an opportunity to really figure out how we're going to transform our school. I'm because if I'm also this, looking at this. Yeah. So like if I'm looking at this from the top down lens, because I was a school leader, right? If I'm comparing two schools and if one school actually has a mission, vision, plan, and they are putting their money where their mouth is regarding making sure that my student collaborates, that they're working creatively, that they're not just reading the same three books over and over again, 
you know, that they are working with people alongside them versus ones that are like, well, this is the way it's always been done. So we're going to keep it that way. Where am I going to send my kid? I'm going to send them to option A instead of option B. Um, and, and, and that, I think like that conversation, especially with school leaders helps to drive that because everybody wants their schools to look good, but are yeah. your schools actually good? Let's have that conversation. Um, and, and, and that's how I start a lot of those discussions. Like who, do you, like, who do you want your kids to be versus who are your kids actually? And how do you make those match up instead of being on two different playing fields? Well, saying something is um, something I'm working on. Uh, and uh, uh, I think being in a mentor role with a new teacher is really, because she's, you know, she's looking at me and sometimes she's she's speaking up before I do, and mm-hmm. um, it's it's new for me. But I I feel like I would be inauthentic, and and I just am tired of sitting there quietly, as uh, you know, we're we're talking about shenanigans, or worse, mm-hmm. we're in a filibuster about the merits of an activity we're doing, right? Strict mandated activity, and then we have teachers filibuster and run the clock and then we don't get to do the activity, which might've provided an insight. And if it's 10 minutes and you get an insight, that's fair. I'll take that, but we don't even get to do it sometimes because of the, because of the filibuster. And it's mm-hmm. you know, somebody I've been doing a better job of saying, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. I, I, I appreciate your perspective, but you know, I'm not sure what that has to do with what we're, what we're working yes, on. Yeah. Sometimes I'm just like, <laughs> right. This is not what we need to be talking about right now. Yeah. But my mm. tendency uh, is to be a little more direct, and I, I, I gotta. I'm working on tempering that um, a little bit, a little bit more. Um, mm-hmm. I know your time is valuable, so I got a, just a, a couple more real quick, so that oh, yeah, I can. No, you're good. So I, 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 I appreciate this conversation. So for exactly what you talked about, one of my sentence stems. Mm -hmm. Um, for just kind of like, again, like what's the game plan is, um, so what are some actionable next steps that we can take for this? Because that kind of moves the conversation from just fluff and talk to like, okay, what are we getting at here? Because it can't just be gobbledygook. I got to know what's happening. Yeah. I've tried paraphrasing and that, uh, that works uh, 50 where I'm like, okay, here's what I'm hearing you say trying to redirect it uh that only works sometimes it depends on the the person but at least you know some people are dialing into the fact that that's my way of helping refocus the the deal here um okay so uh you've been i love the title of this you've been doing a talk recently called trust black women in ed tech yes love the title of it um without giving too much away because i want people to go see you speak um is there what has what has given you this sense that people don't trust black women in that time? Yes. Oh, so again, maybe another <laughs> conversation. Right, well, a whole thing. Right. Again, which is why um I created this session in tandem with my friend and colleague Alicia Sewell. Um, she is phenomenal. She and I have been connected for multiple years. And really, this session was born out of frustration. Like we were just fed up with people not trusting us, with people questioning our credentials, with people not thinking that we understand the ed tech space. And like it, like I, I am very fortunate and so is Alicia to be in spaces where like outside of multiple different things, like we've got pockets of companies where they're like, yes, you, right? Like for me, like Pear Deck and I are like this. Yeah, and you so can't good. see me right they're now. So awesome. like, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm like, I'm crossing my fingers. Like Pear Deck and I are tight. I like Everfy and I are tight. Like they trust me and they'll come to me for anything because they value my voice and they respect and understand yeah. like what, what I bring to the table. I've been in situations where I look at some companies that I haven't necessarily worked with, but I'm like, I'm not really sure if you respect and understand diverse voices and what they bring to the table. Um, And I've also been in situations like consulting where my, again, credentials are being questioned. Um, I am a young black woman. I'm 28 and I get all the time, like little girl, why are you here? Oh goodness. Or I do not believe you have a master's degree and you're 28 or like, who even are you? Um, Alicia has gotten, to the point where people are like, who did you sleep with to get this position? Oh. Yeah, like it is just, 
bonkers. And every single time, like both Alicia and I are like, you don't get to talk to us like that. So that's why we created this presentation because it is really important for us to have that platform and say, this is the nonsense you're bringing to the table and we need to let you know why this is not okay. So the whole presentation is really structured around not just ridiculous things that we have experienced, but also like recruitment, retention, and community with bringing in diverse folks, especially Black women, to the table in educational technology. So what does it look like to not necessarily have them on as a consultant? What does it look like to maybe hire somebody on full time? You know, what might it look like to, you know, be engaged in this kind of community? I'm sure you see it as well, where a lot of districts are like, well, like we're a rural school and like, how do we get like black teachers to come work for us? Or like, how do we get like Latinx teachers to come? And, and it's like those types of conversations where we have to think about it's not just about getting them in the door. It's about keeping them. Yeah, supporting and, them. Yeah, you know? and, 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 and support. And how do we make sure that they are feeling supported in that space? When I, it sounds to me, um, uh, when I got out of, uh, I, I have two master's degree now, but I, my undergrad was at UCLA. And, and But it was during affirmative action here. There was an affirmative action window here in California for, I think it was like 10 years or so. Um, and so, in the few, first few years out, it was, oh, oh, you, you went to UCLA, that was, must have been an affirmative action thing, mm -hmm. you know, and it was just a very yeah. uh, tense thing, and people were very comfortable making that, right. just it's saying like that just out loud. Make it known. And <laughs> like, so, that out loud, it was like, Ooh, yeah, man. we uh, were at a dinner here <laughs> not too long ago, completely unprompted. This woman didn't know us, we didn't know her, and she came up and you know, she, she asked if we lived here, which is, again, always red flag number one. I'm yeah, like, right, why are right. you asking Ooh, whether or not, not right, I'm, I'm like, we are, you are already not off to a good foot. <laughs> um, and I was with my wife, Courtney, and like, I would usually rein it back in public. Courtney is more vocal than me. Um, so she's like, oh, yeah, of course we live here. You know, like, we're not too far away. And the woman looks at us, and she's a white woman, and she goes, well, I'm just surprised that you all live here. And Courtney and I are, are looking at her like, what? Um, and the woman said, well, I'm just surprised you have money. And Courtney said, what? And the woman said, I'm not, I'm just surprised you have money. So then I said, what? And then, Courtney, yeah. and then the woman said, you know, I'm just really surprised that y'all have money. Now, not everybody that lives in this, like in the Seattle area is like rolling in the dough. Right, like right. it does have a reputation for being tech hub. Yes, I do work for a big tech company. Yes, my wife is a nurse, but it's not like we're making like five hundred thousand right. dollars a year and i had a friend that actually thought i made five five hundred thousand dollars some a year. people think right i'm like if i made five hundred thousand dollars a year uh, i would be living in disney world you would not see me. right um but that was something again where she just kind of shared her bias freely and 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 we again she didn't know us we didn't know her and yes we did check her because when that continues and persists like, like if it didn't happen with us, who would it have happened with? Right. Yeah. And that's really challenging and frustrating. Um, and, and again, that's just me and my personal life. I was just out at, at my favorite steakhouse right, with my wife having dinner in your life. But like, even in the ed tech space, like independently as a consultant, because yes, I do work for Microsoft, um, but I do a couple other things just like outside of that, like, like podcasts like you and like, you know, maybe sometimes figuring out like other companies and consulting and uh, Courtney, my wife, again, um, she used to work with a guy who was in the air force and is trying to transition into what he is referring to as a business and diversity consulting, <laughs> despite okay. like not having like a productivity license. He's not certified. Like this man's just trying to do what he wants to do. And uh, he actually tried to ride on the coattails of my presentations for not just ISTE, but also FETC. Oh. Despite not having any background in education, he has no tech training. He's like, right. he, he's like, yeah, just like add me to your presentations so I can build my brand. Oh. And again, th this happens way more often than people think where they just automatically believe people will be okay with just saying things out of pocket or, you know, just like making these off the cuff statements. So this was our attempt at saying, 
stop it. <laughs> um, and it was so well attended that we have a FETC chat coming up, I believe on the 22nd of March. Mm -hmm. uh, we got reached out to by the chair and she's like, we want to keep continuing some of the most popular conversations mm -hmm. from the conference. So can you please kind of like do this Twitter chat? And of course, Alicia and I are like, yeah, girl, we'll do it. Um, but we're hoping to not only submit some more, but also submit like again that like continuing conversation or maybe that update because even though we had 50 minutes it, it easily could have been two hours in that room 100 mm -hmm. and i'm glad that you're that these kinds of talks are are being well received you know it's just mm -hmm. uh and trust is so we could go forever on, on trust also on why people wouldn't trust those of us who have had to perform above and beyond just to be taken minimally credibly you know um uh, we're more than capable of doing whatever job we're in at that moment because it's so much harder to advance and um uh that it that, that trust issue is is such a such a good topic um well i i want to um end every uh, interview, this is my plan for this year, right? Um, with the question, what does it mean to you to mm. teach for justice? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, you, know, you know, since we've been talking a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, which again, that's kind of become kind of like a buzzword phrase, that justice part is imperative. And I don't think that we should ever lose sight of justice because what justice means is that we're actually taking these principles and we're moving them forward, not just for us as educators, but also with our students, right? Like justice means everything we talked about today. It means if you see something, you speak up and you say something. It means that you advocate. It means that if you sense that something is wrong, you speak up. It also means that you're bringing in other lenses, not just yours, in order to make decisions and determine, like, I feel like families in particular are really left out of a lot of these TEIJ, um, and of course, the J, uh, the J stands for justice conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and also too, just making sure that your school is aligned with what that looks like. Because if we're not all for justice, then we're not really working toward it. So Another thing I also want to, uh, and I always point out is that when we're teaching for justice, we don't need to be proficient from the gate. It would be lovely if we all were. Nice. Yep. But like we have to acknowledge we're all at a place where we sometimes we are starting fresh. There's a lot of communities and a lot of information where, I mean, I know nothing about. Um, and, but, but, but I don't try to pretend like I know about it. I am honest about how, hey, I haven't engaged with this community before, or like, hey, I just don't have a lot of experience. I'm here to listen and learn, and there will be action items from me, even if they are small, because baby mm -hmm. steps are still steps. And nice. I think that a lot of folks think that they just need to be like at 100 immediately, nobody's at a hundred. I mean, I've been doing this for years and I'm probably at like 45. Um, so it's one of those things where we just have to be always evolving and always keeping justice at the forefront. And that comes with just starting small. It's, it's okay to start small and it's okay to recognize how you can start small. Things like speaking up, things like examining curriculum. Like these are all great ways to get started baby steps are still steps i mm -hmm. i love that and and yeah and if you don't want to speak up you, maybe you start with uh at least putting a stop to or redirecting somebody who's gotten a little too loose in a department meeting. yes yeah. you know so you're not you're not speaking out but you're saying hey let's how about we get back to the whatever it is how about we get back to the topic or hey changing the subject somehow or, mm. or whatever it might be and that might be for you a, a baby step um, and you swallowed whatever you really wanted to say, and, and maybe a couple of times later, or or one on one. Uh, uh, my yeah. some of my colleagues really one on one is big. Trust me, one on one, yeah. yeah. So sometimes, that's awesome. well, and I'm a big believer too in that. Sometimes you don't have to call something out publicly, right? right. Like, so sometimes something doesn't always need to be called into the court of public opinion. Um, I know that this happens all the time on Twitter where it's right. like, I called you out. I, this needs a response. Like public forum equals public response.
wants. And like, no, it, it, it doesn't need to get messy like that. You can come into the DMs or you can pull me aside after a faculty meeting. Um, I, I've had that happen to me several times where sometimes I'll speak out during a faculty meeting just on my experience. And then people will be pulling me aside saying, thank you for saying that. It really made me think, yeah. right? Now, of course, is, is that like super ideal? Not necessarily, but in the context of growing community, it shows where people are. If they are not comfortable with speaking out in a faculty meeting or a PD or a whatever, that is indicative to maybe the culture does not support right. speaking up out loud. So then the conversation becomes, you were empowered to come speak to me personally, and that is a great first step. So then the next step needs to become how do we do this in an open space where everybody feels brave and valued? And a lot of spaces, to be completely honest, they're not there yet, right? Like no. that's why they will pull you aside. And for the time being, that's okay. But then for like the school culture shift, it's like, okay, what's the next step? What's the next step? Uh, otherwise you're left out there hanging. And exactly. it seems like you're the single lone agitator and, you know, sort of invalidate your enthusiasm. And I, I just think there's time where we, when we know we're right, when we know something's BS, we know it's BS and we can't possibly be the only ones who know this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's tricky. Um, all right. Well, you know, I'm sure there are people who follow you on Twitter and social media and have heard you speak recently. They're very jealous. We've had this much time to just, <laughs> to just talk. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm just someone trying to learn, trying to be on the right path and, and certainly open to being called out um, when, when, I, when I step off. But uh, I truly, truly appreciate this and your time. I know you're, I know you're very busy. Um, so what else do you have uh, coming up and where can people find you if they have um, more questions or just want to kind of be on the Victoria yeah. train? Yeah, great question. Um, who? what is on the horizon? So I just started a new job. I'm on like day 11 right now, which is really exciting. Um, I will be at Q in Palm Springs. And that is from, I believe, the 17th through the 19th. Mm -hmm. um, so my session focuses on combating misinformation with culturally responsive teaching. Nice. So basically everything we just talked about today, right? Like parents and schools and people knocking on the door, yelling about critical race theory and diversity. <laughs> Included. Yes. So, so it's basically about how can we use specific tools and resources to just stop that nonsense, because a lot of times folks will come to us assuming and we just can't assume for them. So how do we shine that light? Um, I will be at ISTE in June, which is mm -hmm. really exciting. That's in New Orleans, which is where I got married. Um, so ISTE is from June 26th through June 29th. Um, and my session is all about ISTE standards, diversity, equity, and inclusion in schools. So again, everything that we just talked about. Right. Um, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at Victoria the Tech, which is by far where I'm the most active. That's where you'll see. Yes, be ready stuff. for hot takes, though, people. If you're gonna, you yes. got to be ready for some hot takes. Yeah, yeah, y'all, and and, and y'all better be ready early because I come in hot in the morning. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes, I wake up at five, and usually my first tweet is at six. So today I was tweeting about how, because because I got um, tea with a friend this morning who actually left her workplace because they were not supporting flexible work. Like mm -hmm. she's a data analyst and they're like, nobody's working from home. So she resigned and I'm just like, I just wonder how many workplaces are losing qualified people because they don't support flexible or remote work. Productive and, people, honest people, right? loyal people. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's that's a little bit about me and where I am. And, you know, my, my dog will make special guest appearances like how he yes. did on the podcast. And sometimes my wife will dance and I'm always at Disney world whenever I'm not here or Disneyland, I'll be in Disneyland in May. Um, so yeah, just ways to keep in touch. And I'm very friendly. Um, even though I come in hot, I am very friendly. So if anybody yes. has questions or anything, uh, you can ask. And my dad is also on Twitter, which is pretty cool. I know, I know which is awesome. Uh, yeah. And I can vouch for the fact that the, you got a nice combination of the hot takes and the genuine uh, friendliness. And I appreciate you uh, people. She's on a podcast right now that has no listeners, right? <laughs> um, that is growing. And it's just a teacher trying to um, be on the right path and help kids out. And this is the kind of, of human we're talking about. And, and so I just want to encourage you all to um, 
you know, give her a follow on Twitter and, and, and try to uh, understand and, and be part of uh, what you're doing. Cause it's really good stuff. And most importantly, I feel like it puts kids first and, uh, and that's what I'm trying to do this year. And so um, yes. thank you. Thank you very, very much. It was a, it was a pleasure to have you. Yeah. Thank you for letting me be here. This was awesome. It's always fun catching up, not just with friends, but friends who also like understand the mission and how we need to move education forward. Yes, it's a it's a growing group. It's a small group, but it's a growing group. And I'm so grateful for the group. All right. That's that's it for today. Thank you.